Okay, well, um, first I should say that I'm really glad to be here, and uh, I'd, I'd like to say thanks to all the people who've worked on Boost uh, for such a long time. Actually, I think uh, the Boost libraries are, I mean, first of all, they're sort of essential to making C++ a really usable language. It's, it's strange to say that we've all used C++ you know, before Boost came along, I guess. Uh, but when you look at that, those times, I mean, you just think C++ really wasn't uh, a fully usable language before the Boost libraries. And, uh, <coughs> and we can see that from the adoption of, of some of the Boost libraries into the standard. So it, thanks, thanks for all the hard work before. And uh, <coughs> so about my talk, well, um, so y I'm not really a software engineer by profession, I'm a, an astronomer, so I'll talk a, a little bit about what I do uh, in my day job. Um, so a large part, or well, about half of my talk is going to be about just numerical computation in C++, why uh, it's, you know, it's the, getting good performance out of C++ is not trivial, but now we, we can get really excellent uh, performance out of C++, although you know, it's still probably true to say that we, C++ is still not the language of choice for the writing of really best, highest performance libraries for numerical computation. And I'll talk a little bit about why I think that's the case. And then in the second half of my talk is, um, you know, it's a proposal of how we can perhaps uh, use more of C++ in high performance computing and how we can write even better libraries. So, uh, so the second part is, um, it's more, well, both parts are about ideas. The first part is about established ideas, and hopefully that's going to be useful uh, for a, at least a, a fraction of the people here. And the second part is about a new idea, so, um, which you know, hopefully is going to be useful to at least one person here. So. <laughs> okay, um, so, so let me just go first. I'll, I'll, I'm going to you know, do this the wrong way around and actually put a summary of the ideas I'm going to try and present uh, first. And then hopefully as we go through you can keep track of whether I've actually explained these properly or not. So, so the, first, the first thing I want to say, uh, really, and I think probably most people here are aware of this, is that the, the rules of standard C++ lead to inefficient numerical code. So if you want to, of course C++ was designed uh, as a way of having a higher level of abstraction as compared to plain old C, right? So that, that was the whole point of the language, that you can, you, know, you can write A plus B plus C plus D, and these could be matrices, and they would all get added together. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is if you simply apply the rules of C++ uh, to this expression, what comes out is not going to be efficient. It just, there's no way it can be uh, in a simple implementation. In, so for a long while, uh, you know, the, the way C++ um, made up some of this performance, uh, uh, you know, lack of performance was through the you know, very, very clever optimizing compilers. And that's, that's going to be a thread through this talk uh, throughout. I mean, the optimizing, the, the amount of optimizations that the compilers do really can turn a language which is intrinsically not you know, the expressions which are not really efficiently written into something which is quite efficient. And it's all due to this incredible complexity and incredible clever algorithms within the compilers. So, uh, so the standard stand rules are inherently not really efficient for numerical uh, computations if you use the abstractions. However, it's through, and we heard about this actually in many of the talks uh, here, uh, through the use of, expression of templates, it's possible essentially to create sub-languages within C++, right? So use of expression templates allows you to create new rules, uh, and you know, the way this works is that we basically use or abuse the, the type system uh, in C++, and we use the type uh, to confer information about the algorithm that we want to have computed, right? So the type actually encodes not just sort of type of the data that we are passing around, but actually what it is that we want to have done on the data. Um, and then through the use of uh, templates, we translate this type essentially at compile time into a more, into a better optimized algorithm, uh, which then the C++ compiler optimizes even further. Uh, and, you know, it allows you to, to defeat some of the, 
the problems in C++ and actually create very efficient code. So, so the third point here is that you know, this has made uh, very high performance numerical C++ libraries possible and actually quite successful. And um, I mean, I was uh, surprised to hear that actually now, you know, some of the matrix, you know, the Eigen matrix library is actually competitive uh, with you know, Intel's MKL on on specific processes. So it's it's and it's clearly very you know, very very successful. So. So, the, so that's sort of the first half of the talk, and then the second half is uh, you know this you know the new idea, and basically, you know, is our expression templates is that enough to to get the last little bit of juice from your machines? Um, and I you know I would argue that it's not, and one of the reasons is simply that you know the best algorithm is not obvious at compile time. You simply can't, you know, even if you, you know, you have, a, you have, you can pick any, you have, you have the ability to generate any particular algorithm, you simply don't know which one it is that's going to be the most efficient. And in part, it depends in part on the parameters, which we only find out at runtime, but also it depends a lot on the very, very precise hardware that you have. So, you know, the difference between a Pentium M chip and uh, you know, a Pentium Xeon chip is huge. Uh, and if you just compile once and expect these, you know, the same algorithm to run on both of these processors and be optimal, well, you know, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be out by a factor of, you know, 50% or so. Right. So it depends all on, you know, it depends on the speed of the main memory bus. It depends on. Um, the the sizes of the each of the caches and it depends on the speed of the caches and lots of other things. So that's that's part one. Why well, I think this is not enough. And part two is, you know, do we really have all the flexibility and all the tools within the C++ compiler itself to generate the necessary code? And you know, one, you know, the, probably the best example is generation of GPU code. Right. So we don't have the mechanism within. GCC to generate GPU code at the moment. So, you, know, you can never get GPU output from partial specializations of templates within GCC. Right? It simply can't be done. So, you do need to use an external tool for this. And how do you fit in external tools into expression templates? So, so that, that's that's why I would say that you know there is room in very specialized applications for something else other than expression templates. And um, and you know the the, the sort of the idea I want to present is that you actually you 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 put stub expression templates into your library, uh, so you you, know, you have the full type system of expression templates, but you don't actually provide any implementation, and then you go through the object code generated by the compilation, you look at the functions which are called in this object code. And from the types of these functions, you can then post-factor generate implementations for each one of those using whichever set of tools you want. So it's basically a way of restoring modularity between interface specification and implementation, which is you know, what we used to have in the ancient C world uh, and we lost through the use of very large header libraries in C++. Okay, so that's the overview and if I'm if it looks like I'm missing, you know, I haven't explained a large part of this, please do shout out <laughs> to any part of the talk uh, because you know, I was probably the worst offender you know, about shouting out in the middle. So, um, okay, so right, so this is the outline of the actual head headings, so I'm just going to skip that and first talk about you know, my main day job. Uh, so this is, the, this is the main project I work on and it's, it's called the Atacama Large Millimeter Ray. Um, and it's it's a it's a very large radio telescope uh, being commissioned uh, now, essentially. So it's been commissioned. It's been in the commissioning stage for the past two years. Uh, so this is this is what it looked like um, a few months ago, and now we are up to 12 antennas. Eventually, there's going to be 66 of these 12 meter diameter antennas, and they are situated in the driest place on Earth we can find, which is the Atacama Desert in, in northern Chile, at an at elevation of 5,000 meters, which means that you can't do any programming there, for sure, and, uh, because there's not enough oxygen. And um, so, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, it's sort of one of the, the, the largest ground-based astronomy projects in the world. So it doesn't, you know, the space-based astronomy projects are 
huge and you know, they, they use up a huge amount of money. But in terms of what we do on the ground, this is the largest thing we're doing at the moment. So, um, yeah, so that's, so I, I'm writing some of the calibration software for this and, some, and designing some of the hardware and so on. So that's one of the things I work on. Uh, so the second telescope that I work on is uh, the Green Bank Telescope, which is actually here in the US, in West Virginia. Um, and this is actually the largest steerable telescope in the world. So, so, this, so from here to here, it's 110 meters. Uh, and from there to there, it's 160 meters in height. Um, so it's basically, it's actually the, the largest fully steerable structure of any type in the world that you can put in any direction. Um, and the, um, and you know, the, the tricky bit with this is that you know, it weighs some huge amount. Uh, it's all steel and it's, it's very, very heavy. And we need to have the whole structure accurate to a quarter of a millimeter, right? So the whole thing is it has to be precise to a quarter of the millimeter. So one of the things I've been working on for a long time is how do you, and, you know, and just, I mean, obviously just changing the temperature of this side of the telescope by one degree compared to this side will twist the whole structure by more than, you know, a quarter of a millimeter. So, you know, one of the things I work on is, you know, basically real-time calibration techniques where you adjust the surface of the telescope to compensate for the, you know, the formation in the structure as a whole. Okay, so these are, yeah, so I'm just abusing my profession to show some pretty pictures here then. <laughs> it has nothing to do with C++, I'm sorry to say. Okay, and uh, yeah, and, uh, and this is, these are some of the observations I do. So this is, uh, this is a nearby galaxy, uh, Messier 66, uh, and um, so the, the, the color scale is an image from a space observatory called Spitzer, and it's, in me it's, it's a measurement of the emission from hot dust. Uh, in this galaxy, and the contours are, um, are images so made with a novel camera, which actually it's a camera, but which observes the radio waves, a three millimeter radio waves, and it, you know the the radio waves are a measurement of the hot electron gas within this galaxy. So it, this you know, the image was actually made with this telescope. Okay, so that's just um, that's just some of the uh, type of things uh, that we do in astronomy, and yeah, my other interests are. Um, you know, model optimization, uh, statistical interference. I did actually used to work in, in finance, so, and I still have sort of an interest in, you know, computational issues in, in finance, uh, in, in particular with, to do with risk management of derivatives and, um, you know, radiative transfer and physical simulation, these type of things. And uh, the thread which brings all these together, really, is that they all are very numerically intensive applications, right? So there are, you know, a lot of this, almost everything uh, that we do in astronomy and in many of the other fields is limited uh, by our ability to do computing and by the quantity of computing we can do. You know, and so it's a surprising thing to say, but really, you know, it's not about equations, it's not about, you know, sitting there and just thinking about random, you know, clever thoughts. It's just the ability to get things right uh, and the quantity of computation and the quantity of data we can process. Okay, so, so the two examples that I'm going to go a little bit more in, in, in detail in is aperture synthesis radio astronomy. So this is a technique uh, which, is, uh, which is the basis of the telescope that I was showing here. Right? So, these, so these are here eight telescopes, eventually it's going to be 66 telescopes. Uh, and the idea is that instead of building one huge telescope, uh, you actually uh, you, you have lots of small telescopes which you connect up together. Right. And then you try to form an image that would have been seen by a single very large telescope. So as if you know, these telescopes, as far you know, you had the one telescope which actually spanned the whole distance, which is the distance between the constituents, little telescopes. So this was, you know, this was a, a big evolution in, in astronomy. And um, in fact, it was actually the development of this was closely, or it was completely determined by the development of computers, so first electronic computers, and the development of the fast Fourier transform. Right? Because this technique is totally dependent, you are, what you're actually measuring is the Fourier transform of the sky. Right? So to, to get back to the sky, you need to be able to do Fourier transform. So that was an incredibly computationally a uh, difficult problem in the 50s and the 60s. And it was only once computers really caught up with these ideas that it was started to be possible to do this. So, um, so it's a very computationally 
uh, you know, intensive problem, and it's also a data I I intensive problem. So the, the task we're, bu we're building in Chile, it, the output rate is about 20 megabytes per second, which is actually, you know, it's not a huge rate, but it, it sort of becomes quite inconvenient, especially if you have, if you're trying to interact with this data, you know, in a, in a sequential basis. So you're sitting there saying, well, let me sum of these data together, and then ma let me make an image of this data, and let me calibrate this bit. And if you have tens of gigabytes of data and a slow processing algorithm, you know, you just, you will not be very productive because you're going to be waiting for minutes or hours between each operation. Right? So it, it sort of, you know, having a, an efficient implementation of our algorithms really gets uh, the most out of, you know, everybody's time. So it's, it's quite important. And actually, it, and encourages people to get it right because otherwise, you know, they'll just type in something and say, well, this is enough. I can't be bothered to wait another day to recompute it. So that's, 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 that's today. And so the, the next big project in radio astronomy is called the Square Kilometer Array. Uh, and here, instead of 66 antennas, we're going to be having thousands of antennas. Right? And here, you know, in this case, uh, the, 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 what the telescope can do and what the science is going to be able to do is going to be completely dominated by computational issues. Right? So everything, uh, you know, the, sort of the amount of images that you get, the precision, it's all going to be limited by the computational power. And uh, the, you know, the main computer, you know, we're budgeting for about 500 megawatts of electrical power. And the side computer is also going to be, you know, also another 500 megawatts. Right? So we're going to need a whole power station to run this thing. And still, you know, the, the, the limit is going to be computation. So, you know, the having efficient algorithms is, it's, you know, it's clearly I I important for all of this. So that's example number one. Um, example number two is risk management of, you know, derivative contracts in finance. And yeah, people could yeah. There's many different ways of thinking about this, but um, yeah, one of the ways of thinking about it is you know just the cost of electricity <laughs> that you end up using. So some of you will be aware of you know how this how these things work. But um, so you know, my experience was, for example, in, in credit derivatives, and there there was 2,000 nodes uh, which were running 24/7, uh, and you could basically you basically allowed one kilowatt uh, per node uh, plus you know, 50% air conditioning cost, so that adds up to 3 megawatts of power that you're using 24-7. Um, and, you know, well, so, you know, we have, so one kilowatt hour in the UK is 10, 10 pence per second, and there's 8,500 hours in a year. So it basically ends up that you're spending 2.5 million pounds uh, per year on just electricity cost. Uh, for for your you know, for your grids machines, uh, yeah, this is not the most efficient type of nodes that you know you can get these days. But that's you know you never do have the most efficient ones. You, know, you just have the ones which are on the approved list. So and plus there's a, you know, all sorts of additional costs, you know, which is also proportional to the number of nodes. So even so, you know, this is not a question here. We don't have a question of polarization. You know, we have enough nodes, but it's just if you can reduce the computational load by 20%, you know, that's immediately a, a big saving, right, every year straight away. So it's, so it, whilst it's true that in many cases these days you can scale up and you can just spend more money uh, and get more performance, you know, the amount of money that you're spending means that actually it's, it's starting to be profitable to make even small gains in efficiency of algorithms. Right, <coughs> okay, so and yes, yeah, so this this slide here is just talks a little bit about you know repeats what I've just said. So uh, yeah, the, I think it's yeah it's obviously you know I'm going to talk about high performance algorithms you know, today, but it is always important to think you know, does it actually matter? I mean, is it if you have a really easy to parallelize problem, is it worth it spending time making each thread more efficient in a way? Right. So and there is the yeah the question is. You have to think about cost, obviously, and that's that's the obvious thing. You know, if you have 10,000 nodes, that's going to cost you something just for electricity. Uh, but you know, but there's other things other than cost. So, for example, you know, heat dissipation and the power of availability, and actually how much floor space you have. So, in fact, in many applications, these end up being. You can always convince people to give you a bit more money, 
but yeah, convincing them to build you a new building to put in the computers is it's very hard. It takes a long time, right? So, and then you know you want to think about the environmental impact. You know, ruining the planet by doing too much computation and so on. Um, you know, the, the time it requires to scale up. So, you, you know, even though you might have the space and you might have the money and you might have the electricity, just actually getting, you know, getting the computers in, scaling things up, it might take too long. And you might find that actually, you know, you're not able to satisfy your customers' requirements. Um, and, yeah, the access to capital and so on. So, um, so in many problems which are easy parallelizable, um, you know, you do have to, it's not just the cost, but you know, there's always there's always a trade-off, right? And then there are some cases where you can't parallel. You know, there are some algorithms which you simply can't parallelize very well. And then you know, getting the most out of a sort of a single core is a, it becomes a case of really, you know, is this feasible? Uh, and what's the latency and what's the user experience? Um, so actually, yeah. And um, in, in in sort of scientific areas, there are there's a sort of a uh, extra constraint, which is that quite often we have experiments which are in space, uh, and then all of these things become you know, even more difficult. So you, you know, you can't. You, you have very limited in power. You're very limited in the available uh, amount of space to have your computers, and you have no air to cool uh, the processes. So you know, if you have 10 watts of power. Uh, heating a small area without any air to cool the processor, it will just melt away very quickly, and maybe you will not have a processor anymore, uh, which is not good. So, um, so you know, numerical performance is important, but it's always good to keep a you know look at the big picture and actually think, you know, is it worth it what I'm trying to do? Okay, so and then you know the second sort of cautionary note I should say is that you know in many cases. Um, you know, we have big systems, but actually the, the you know, computationally um, intensive parts are really small parts of these big systems, and it's really easy to identify what they are. So actually we have quite small problems. And for small problems, often it's, it's good to use simple solutions, right? So, you know, we don't, you know, in fact, you know, most of the problems in real life are small problems with which you can build simple solutions for, and building a huge library and thinking of something really, really clever uh, to solve it is perhaps not, uh, you know, the best approach. So, um, so this is, I mean, you know, this is a silly example which I had lying around of adding. You know, it's a, it's a trivial function which just adds two vectors, and I'm going to be talking about more about addition of two arrays in, in this talk, which is a trivial, you know, sort of operation, but. Yeah, it's very very simple, but you know, it's a simple loop. Uh, but it uses the uh, you know, single instructional multiple data intrinsic here. So this intrinsic here is uh, uses calls the uh, the intrinsic in it calls the SIM the SSE three instruction, which adds. So it stores two double floating point numbers side by side in a 100, 128 bit register, uh, and then stores the the second set in another register and adds both of them. In parallel, basically. So you've just saved yourself 50% of the time by by adding two two numbers together. So, and this is yeah. Why not the actual SSH intrinsics? Sorry. Curious. Why do you use the built-in IA32 style intrinsics and not the EMM intrinsic.h intrinsic? Well, this is just. Yeah, so the question is why I was using the uh, the IA32 intrinsic and not the IMM uh, intrinsic. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a whole set of names that yeah. are defined. Right, so, well, this is the way I knew how to do it, is the answer. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, so, uh, you know, but the point, my, yeah, my point is that if all you need to do is add two arrays together, yeah, then you know, you should, I encourage you to listen to the rest of the talk, but, uh, you know, don't, you know, why, you know, why go through the trouble of building a whole library to, to do it, right? So, and the fact is that many real-life problems, uh, with a little bit of analysis, you can identify, uh, you know, the, the, a very small subset of instructions uh, which, uh, which contain all the sort of meat of the computation. And in those cases, you know, you have to, again, trade off uh, you know, building a huge framework against, you know, just doing something simple by hand. Okay, so 
for small problems, small small systems, this by hand solutions are actually you know, reasonable. But it's not reasonable for for large systems, for really large um, numerical systems. Um, and and why not? Well. I mean, first of all, it's correctness, right? And this is the whole reason why we want to have abstraction in our, uh, in our programming languages. Just convincing yourself that it's correct uh, becomes hard, right? Especially when you, know, you have layers of numerical computation on top of each other, and it becomes quite difficult. You, know, you have quite close interaction between these layers. Uh, so actually convincing yourself that you're doing the right thing. It's very important uh, <laughs> because Either you can lose a lot of money, or you can blow up a satellite, or you know you can get wrong scientific results. Uh, but actually convincing yourself it's 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 correct. It's much easier when you have a nice abstract, simple syntax which you can look at, and you can show it to your colleague, and you can show it to another colleague, and you, you, all three of you can go through it together and read it and think, aha, uh -huh, well this looks looks about right. So, and then you know the the. You know, the hand code thing, it's, it's not maintainable, you know, what happens when we Intel changes the names or, of these intrinsics or whatnot, or you go to the next processor along, or you go to a totally different operating system, or, you know, there's a new mode within the floating point unit or whatever. Uh, it's not portable, so you, you want to have, a you know, library gives you much more portability, it gives you more readability, you know, it's, it's, um, and it's far more maintainable. So, and then what you actually find in, in complex system that you can't, you know, everybody says, well, you know, you do the analysis step first and you identify the bits, you know, which are computationally intensive and then you just, uh, you know, implement them by hand or you ask Intel, you know, you pay them some money and they'll do it for you and whatnot. What uh, but the problem is actually quite often, you know, we don't really understand what the best algorithm is. Well, you know, for you know, after you sometimes it's you know years after we started you know built the system and started getting data, then you you think well actually we have to you know if you change this and we, if you move this algorithm a little bit like that you know, you're actually changing you're changing the mathematics of what you're doing after you find out you know what the data is telling you essentially so and then you find that these hand coded. Um, implementations actually really slow you down because all of a sudden what you thought you, know, you thought you only ever going to be adding two vectors but now you need to add three vectors right and so somebody has to go back and rewrite that and so on. so um, you know even things which seem fixed to begin with eventually everything gets uh, you know shifted around uh, <clears throat> and then you know there's a whole uh, topic of, of approximations and um, yes a lot of well, much much numerical computation is limited simply by the throughput, so the memory throughputs of processors, but not all of it. So there are, you know, all the transcendental operations and division and many other things are actually limited by the amount of precision that you want. And you, know, you want to have a system where you can actually you know, dial in how much accuracy you need from each particular operation and save some time by that. And actually, in, in realistic algorithms, you can save a lot of time uh, doing that. And <coughs> I mean, one simple example in, in finance is the exponential function. And you know, you end up well, if you do profiling of big financial codes, actually, you find that you know, you're computing exponentials all the time. That's where all the time gets eaten. Uh, and then you have to ask, well, do you do you, do you actually need you know all? Do you need the result, which is accurate to the full double precision or you know could you do with you know slightly less accurate and in most cases you could and that, that will save you really a lot of time and these all these things become more much more easier when you have a proper framework and a real library uh, to, to do this in okay yeah okay so <laughs> this is a yes yeah, so this is the caution slide so I'm going to talk now <laughs> yeah so I'm going to talk about so yeah the uh, Expression templates and this this idea of, of lazy code generation, which is the new idea. Um, and yeah, but I'm not saying you should go out all and start rewriting expression template libraries, or or writing lazy code generation libraries because there's many many you know, existing libraries and you, know, you should always think about using those first. Okay, so I just thought I should say this because sometimes I know, you know, everywhere people tend to want to use a new idea straight away. And it's uh, 
you know, it's interesting, but it doesn't pay off very often. Okay, so, <coughs> um, well, I, I mean, I'm sure in some of the previous conferences people have talked about, you know, what you need to do to get the highest possible numerical performance out of your code. Um, and the first yeah, and the most important thing is to maximize parallelization, right? And the, there's lots of ways to do it. So if you have lots of nodes, you, know, you want to use all the nodes, and then you have the processors and the cores. And then you should also be thinking about, you know, each core, what sort of execution units it has inside, and, you know, should you be trying to interleave instructions? So if you have, a, a, you know, two, uh, you know, s several uh, execution units within the same core of a processor, actually thinking about the way you interleave instructions and interleaving, say, additions and uh, divisions and so on, actually gets you higher performance out of a single core, because, you know, there's, there's several different routes that instructions can go through the processor, uh, and by interleaving correctly these instructions, you can get, um, you know, you can use more of the silicon at the same time, essentially. So that's, you know, that's one of the key things, and using the single instruction multiple data uh, instruction sets, so that, that, that's a huge uh, benefit, and depending whether you're doing single precision or double precision, you know, most things can be accelerated by a factor of two to four. So that's so that's sort of the obvious thing. Uh, the second thing which uh, most people are aware of is um, that you need is that you need to minimize memory access, um, just because the 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 main well the main memory in in modern computers is very very slow. So I think if you miss if you miss all the caches, I think the penalty is about 100 cycles on a mo modern processor. So you're losing 100 cycles waiting for a piece of data to come in. Where it takes only one cycle to do an addition, right? So you slow down your program by a factor of 100, um, which is pretty bad. So, um, so you want to keep the data that you're going to process together close together, and if you need to process the same data several times, you want to do that in one go. Well, you know, you want to have these processing steps happening at the same time, whilst the data is still in the caches, and then you send it back to the main memory. So you don't want to. Yeah, the last thing you want to do is you know, do a simple operation on a piece of data, send it back into memory, and then one second later ask for it back, and then do another simple operation and send it back. That's, that's very inefficient. So you want to do you know, as many steps as you possibly can at the same time. Um, so, um, and obviously you know, creating temporaries is not going to be efficient at all because you're just using extra space in main memory and just pay, you're getting stuff to the main memory and back. So that, that, yeah, minimizing memory access is, is for many, many um, numerical processes essentially the, the limiting step. So that's the sort of thing that you need to think most about. Um, and then you have um, then sort of slightly more esoteric things like you know, thinking about the branching. Uh, so you want to have um, you, you want to keep the, the branching logic within your code as simple as possible so that the uh, speculative execution uh, of the process and the pipeline continues to work as well as it can. Uh, but on the other hand, you also need to have enough code at hand to execute. So remember that you know, if, you know, if the, all the data is there, but your processor doesn't have the instruction which it needs to execute next, that's just as bad, right? So it's still waiting 100 cycles for that instruction to come from main memory. So that's, that's not good either. So um, you don't want to have huge code which you, know, you can't fit. If you have a big loop, uh, if the body of the loop is so huge, you unroll the loop so much that the number of instructions actually doesn't fit into the cache, uh, the instruction cache of the processor, then it's going to be waiting for the instruction to come in from main memory. And then that's, you know, that's, that's not good either. So you want to have, so you want to unroll the loops, but not too much is basically <laughs> what I'm saying, and you want to inline functions, but not too much, right? because you don't want to fill up the instruction cache. Um, and then there's you know the thing there's things like uh, minimizing the, the quantity of transcendental calculations. So iterative, so these are often implemented as iterative calculations within the processor itself, and essentially division is included in this, right? So every division that you do on a processor is, is a huge penalty, right? It's, it takes a really long time. Um, and you know you can save time for all of these by reducing the the precision. So going to single precision instead of double precision, or the accuracy. So saying you know I have double precision, but I don't need to 
to be accurate to double precision. I can take a, you know, 0.001% error. So yeah, so these are the sort of requirements for good numerical performance. Um, and then you know, the optimization challenge is, is to satisfy these requirements while still being able to write something as simple as that, right? So a simple a plus b plus c plus d plus e, you know, to add five arrays. Yeah? Why not? Here? Well, in plain C++, you didn't, but if you use expression templates, you do, so that's going to be the, okay. the, the main punch point. But it is that you want to be writing here. You'd much rather write something like that rather than have you know, some really long function name uh, in C which um, you know, adds five, these five vectors. So, um, so you know, how do we match? Right, so, but like you said, in, in simple C++, so if these were simple C++ objects, then you know, they, this would not match at all to all of these requirements, especially not temporaries, like you say, and not to memory locality. And you couldn't use SIMD and you know, it would all be a mess, right? Uh, and why, why not? Well, you know, the fundamental reason is that, um, well, fundamental reason number one is that unlike Haskell, which we you know, heard about yesterday, C++ is eager, which means that the argument to each function is fully evaluated before the function is called. Right? So if you have f of a plus b, sorry, f of a and b, uh, then a gets fully evaluated uh, and b gets fully evaluated and then it's passed into the f. Right? So you are, you essentially what you're doing is you're doing one thing at a time, which is a sensible thing, uh, but uh, it doesn't make for efficient code. So, so C++ is eager and everything is evaluated before being passed into a function. And additionally, operators always take two arguments at most. So you know, this expression here would read a plus b, compute that, plus c, compute that, plus d, compute that, plus c, compute that. Okay? And that's, and you have creation of temporaries. So you're doing, you know, everything is done at, uh, you know, simple one step at a time, but it's just, it's, that is not suitable for fast code, and I'll show you know, more about why that is. Um, and then, so that's, so that's, you yeah, know, this is why we need expression templates, and, that, and this is why, uh, you know, they work so well. And the second set of challenges is, um, is that, you know, we want, to be able to compile uh, the, the software on one set of hardware and run it on many different hardware uh, setups, right? So, and that's if you actually ship, if you're not doing open source, but you're actually shipping uh, software to other people, then you know, this becomes very important. Uh, you might want to change the rules uh, for the generations of implementation you know, after you've actually compiled your main application. So what if you, you know, you've got your application and then you have a new, a new CPU comes out or a new GPU comes out and you want to take, make use of it, can you make use of it without actually having to recompile uh, the original source code, which maybe you don't have the right to recompile anymore because somebody's given you, uh, the, you know, that bit just as object code. And then, like I said, you know, actually the optimum algorithm, you know, how you should do uh, each set of operations is, is very, very dependent on the precise hardware that you have. And yeah, so these you know, that makes it quite hard to, to pick the optimum algorithm. Okay, oh here's a, so here's a sim very simple example. Um, so this is a this is a simple function which adds up all the elements uh, of a matrix. So I'm just using a U plus matrix of doubles here with some number of rows and some number of columns. And um, so here I'm iterating over uh, so the I'm iterating over columns first and then over rows, and just adding up the elements, okay? So that's, you know, version number one. Version number two, uh, here I'm iterating over the, the rows first, so I'm going through the rows first, and then through the columns of the matrix, right? Uh, and just adding up the elements. And uh, so, and then if I look at the different sized uh, rows, and you know, different sized matrices, so the, the number of elements is always the same because the, the product of rows and columns is the same. 
uh, in this case, and this is the time that uh, it takes to go through the matrix columns first, so going through the matrix like that, and, and this is the time that it goes through go row first, so going through the matrix like that, okay? And, uh, and you know, all of these numbers are roughly the same, and all of these numbers are roughly the same, except this one, right? And, th you know, this, in this case, it's a factor of two slower, right? Uh, so this is for my lab, you know, you could try this on a different compiler, different machine, and you, you'd be a totally different answer. But, you know, predicting a priori that it was going to be this, this size of matrix, which was the most different one, is hard. It's very hard. I mean, I couldn't tell you now why it is that in this particular case, I've lost a factor of two in performance, right? Whilst for, in all the other cases, it's only 10%, okay? So it's this difficulty to predict uh, the performance of even simple, you know, trivial operations, which is just adding up all the elements I in a matrix, which makes this complicated. And this is why, uh, this is why we have, um, you know, the libraries which just go through many, many different possible algorithms, try them out on a real you know, CPU and see which one works best and just pick that one. Yeah. Right, but you could, but how would that change if I went to then, uh, you know, your laptop instead of my laptop is the question. <laughs> right, so how can I, you know, how can I, if I know what's best for my own laptop, that's not enough, right? So, so it doesn't, even if I could tell, you know, on my own laptop, which is the best, I, you know, I want to have, you need to have something which you can use on everybody's machine. Right? So, uh, yeah, and, um, Right, and the problem is in C++, it's very, you know, you can't, because you have one single compilation stage, it's not possible ever to actually try different algorithms and select one during the compilation. Okay, so, I mean, uh, yeah, so how do, I mean, given all these problems, you know, why, why, do, why do we have really high performance libraries and how do they work? Um, well, a big part of it is, like I said, optimizing compilers. So, you know, the compilers we use actually fix, you know, they, after they've seen, you know, you know, a big chunk of your program, they don't have to follow the precise rules of the language because they are allowed to transform the, what you wrote into an equivalent representation, essentially, which is more efficient. So, you know, optimizing compilers are yeah, they sort of recover a large fraction of performance which would be lost otherwise. And that's why we don't see in, in practice quite as much, quite how bad uh, you know, the simple rules of C++ are. So that's, that's a big part. And then you, know, you have custom compilers from standard languages. So for example, if you buy you know, uh, a library from NAG, numerical algorithms group, uh, which I think Intel does, <laughs> The, um, you know, they have their own Fortran compiler, right? That's, that's the key to the, you know, they write it. They say they write it in Fortran and it's high performance, but it's high performance because they write the compiler for it as well, right? And the compiler is essentially doing, you know, they're writing the optimization into the compiler, uh, and that's why they can get really high performance. Um, but, you know, writing compilers is hard. It's really, really hard. Uh, yeah, it's worth it for them, but it's a very specialized company. Uh, then, uh, you know, you can use code generation. So instead of going through a standard language and uh, you know, a standard compiler, you, you can actually use a custom language or framework and just generate the code separately. So for some simple problems, you don't really need to, you know, you're not doing the full compilation stage. You just need to be mashing together different bits of assembly. And you can write your own sort of mini compiler to do that and write machine code straight away. Uh, then you have libraries which do runtime selection according to the hardware they detect. So I think this is what the Intel library does. It actually, you know, it tries to find out as much as it can about the processor and then it tries to make some reasonable assumptions about, you know, what the best combination of algorithms to use is. Uh, MKL. Um, and then you have um, you know, runtime profiling of multiple or even, you know, very many algorithms, which is the idea that, you know, once the program starts, uh, you know, it goes through the possibilities of these algorithms and see how much time each one takes and then it simply picks the fastest one. And then for the rest of the execution, it just uses that. Uh, and then you do even have, I mean, there are libraries now which will do runtime generation of machine code. So you'll pass in an expression as a string 
and it will actually compile that string at runtime into machine code and give you a pointer to a function and you call that function and you know it's it can be quite efficient and uh, you know i would i would argue that expression templates and uh, you know lazy code generation basically means that you can adapt all of these techniques to standard c++ okay um, so uh, as a simple case study is, and I'll sort of use this again, is, is the library called FFTW, which do many people know about this library? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's you know, it was actually, it's a library for doing fast Fourier transforms. Uh, and it was, at the time it came out, it was quite revolutionary and it was much, much faster than um, even vendor supplied libraries and it really, you know, gave everybody a big kick to try and catch up, and now they have. But it was at the time it was revolutionary, and actually how it works, it's it's very interesting. Um, so the actual uh, so FFT algorithm is it's a great study because there's very many different ways you can do one Fourier transforms. Just you know you have lots of options about how you access the memory because you can do it. Uh, you, you know, you can, there's many different patterns in which you access the memory and decompose the whole algorithm and still get the same result. Um, so, so the way the library works is that the, the, base, uh, the basic uh, building blocks of the algorithms, which are called codelets, are, are written in an abstract syntax in this, you know, in OCAM, OCAML, whatever it's pronounced. Uh, and that, 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 from that functional language, you actually generate C and then you just call your normal C compiler to ma generate machine code. Uh, and that builds all sorts of different sub-algorithms, right? So these, these are fixed at compile time of the library. So you have, you have a big, big different set of these sub-algorithms. And then to do any particular Fourier transform, you can combine these uh, sub-algorithms in different ways. So any one transform is basically a product of several different of these sub-algorithms. So you can, you know, you put them together and and you get the, the Fourier transform uh, that you want. So, um, so the, the sub, so the sub-algorithms are de de defined at, at compile time and then at runtime, when you start your program, you say, I need to do this sized Fourier transform. And the, the library basically goes through many different possible combinations of these codelets, tries them out, uh, and just selects the, the best um, the best combination of these algorithms to do what you need to do. And it, it's fast. I mean, it, it, the result is very, very efficient and very fast. And in, you know, it takes, takes um, you can do SIM, so you can use SSE, SSE1234 instructions, and it can do threads, and it can do MPI, all within this single framework. And yeah, so it's a, it's a great library. But the beauty of it is that it really presents a trivial interface so all of this, you know, it looks all, you know, complicated, but actually it's essentially just two C functions that you call. And you can use it from C, you can use it from Fortran, you can use it from Excel, you know, you can use it from any language and it's, it's simple. And, you know, why? Well, because, you know, Fourier transforms are such a well-defined algorithm, right? So that's, that's, that's why this is possible, is because, you know, there's only two parameters, which is, you know, how big is your array in this dimension and how big is your array in this dimension, right? And that's it. And then you just pass in the data. And when you have these data-only interfaces, things, you know, you could, it's very easy to make things modular and you should try and make it modular. <laughs> when you have, so, you know, when you have this situation where you have just data passing boundaries, you know, you have a really, really great opportunity for modularity and you can do all of these crazy tricks in the, in the back and still have a really simple interface. Okay, well, I'm, I'm doing a bit short of time, so I'm going to skip some of the subtleties, uh, which you know, um, you know important in, in detail. Uh, so I did, I, yeah. So uh, this morning I put in this little section, which is an interlude, <laughs> uh, which I thought. I mean, I thought, you know, talking to people, I, I realized perhaps not everybody is familiar with these. So this is a single slide section, uh, which is maybe going to be the only useful thing you hear this morning. Uh, but, uh, and you know, how do you, uh, just, you know, just in case people are not aware, I mean, one, you know, you've got your numerical code, and you know, how do you identify actually the bottlenecks? And, uh, you know, the, I mean, for me on Linux, the by far the best tool is called O Profile. So if you really, you know, if you're in this game, 
uh, I really recommend uh, you use this. So the way this works is basically that it, you know, it lets the processor run say a thousand cycles and then it stops the processor and, and says okay where you know where was the instruction pointer pointing at this time records that location and then lets the processor run another thousand cycles and then stops it again and says okay where was the where was the IP uh, pointing to that at that time and by doing this even for a short period of time you basically get a statistical picture of you know which bit, bits of code the CPU is spending most time in, and it's it's a very good because it, you don't actually changing any of the code. So making changes to numerical code of any sort, it, it can affect its performance uh, very much. So this this type of a tick counting profiler is is you know gives you a much better picture of you know where to look in in, in your code for bottlenecks. So and once you've you know once you have a picture of you know where the hotspots are, then you can use a, a core graph profiler like. Well, grind um, to actually see you know which which higher level functions are calling the low level functions where all the hotspots are, so you can identify sort of a bigger picture you know where where the bottlenecks are, um, and then you know then you can start optimizing things and you know using different libraries and writing your own code. And when you're writing your own code, um, you should always look at the assembly. Right? So that's the only way to be really understand if the compiler is doing the right thing. In terms of performance, is to generate the assembly, and um, and you know, gen and then look at it by eye and see what it's doing. Okay. So expression templates. Um, well, we, luckily, I think we had about ten hours of talks about expression templates already. So uh, hopefully, they're all uh, familiar to to most people. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm just gonna explain. You know, why they're useful for numerical computation, and uh, you, know, you have a very, very simple example of numerical or of expression templates. Um, you know, really simple-minded uh, example. So, so here's the as promised. You know, uh, I'm still on the topic of adding vectors together, uh, and here's a simple. Yeah. You know, so I've, in this case, I'm just using the standard library vector. You know, just <coughs> as an example. And I'm just doing a plus b plus a plus b, and taking the third element and storing it in the result. Okay, so there's several reasons uh, why this is inefficient. First of all, we do get this temporary because I'm computing a plus b, and then I've got the result, and then I'm, I add a again, and then I add b again, and and then it, it's inefficient because um, I get all the result as I compute. The result of, of the full vector, all ten, ten elements, and then I only get the fourth element out. Uh, and the third reason why it's inefficient is that this temporary is actually iterated over three times over, right? So I, I iterate over this temporary once when I do a plus b, and then I go through it all again uh, when I add a again, and then I go through it all again when I add b again, right? So for this memory locality, this is this is terrible. Okay. So this is just a simple implementation. You, know, you can't do by default pluses uh, on you know, some library vectors, but you know, this is just how you would do it, and it's you know, just trivial. Okay, so how would you do it with expression templates? And this is a you know, completely a, a minimal example, which I don't recommend you use at all. I mean, you should use one of the proper libraries for numerical computation. But this is you know, this is just how it works. So. So what you need to do is you need to create a structure uh, which it, it doesn't do addition, but it represents that addition should be done. Right? So that's the key. So instead of actually computing things when you see that plus, you say, no, I'm not going to compute it, but I'm going to you know, let you know, the user know or the compiler know that addition should be done at some later stage. Right? And this is what this structure does. And um, so the templates E1 and E2. So BINOP it, it stands for binary operation, uh, and it it uh, it's constructed. It has a left part and the right part. So the left and the right arguments to the binary operation, and both of these are templated. So both of these could be subsidiary binary operations, or they could be values. They could be anything else. Okay, and so those are, those are the two parameters, which are the two sub expressions, uh, and then you have uh, uh, you know tagged. Uh, value 
OP, which is just the operator that you, you know, what do you want to do? And the value operator means just actually don't do anything, just return the value. Uh, and I have, in this very simple example, the only other operator I have is add op, which means add the two things together, right? And if you, you could have a whole algebra on this as well. So, um, uh, so that's that's the structure which contains. So, and the thing to note is, uh, unlike the example yesterday, uh, I here I take the reference to the to the constituent sub-expressions, right? So actually, I you know this this uh, binary structure, it takes the reference to the data, uh, but the type of this binary represents what needs to be done to the data, right? So the type of binary is what to do and the contents of it are reference to the data that needs to be operated on. Um, and then you simply overload operator plus um, so that given some uh, you know, left, uh, left sub-expression and right sub-expression it creates, instead of you know, summing them together in some simple way, it creates a binary operation structure which uh, points to the left sub-expression and the right sub-expression and uh, has add op type saying that we should add them together eventually. Right? We're not doing it now, but eventually we should add them. Uh, and then you need to have some sort of evaluation function or you know, assignment function or not, which actually takes one of these uh, oper binary operation expressions and computes uh, the result. So this is when you say, so now that you know, this is the step where you say, okay, I have this complicated expression, which you know remembers what it, what it needs to do and what data it needs to do it on, and now I want the result. And in this case, I've just called it eval, and I here stands for the ith element. Okay. Um, okay. So that's so the, those are sort of the interface type, and then you just need to define the um, the implementation. So this is the implementation part of expression templates, and it's done through. Uh, partial specialization, right? So I still have E1 and E2 here as um, you know unconstrained types, right? So it will still this still says it knows how to add sub-expressions of any type, but I'm speci partially specializing on add operations. So I'm partially specializing on the fact that you know on on addition, and all I do is recursively evaluate the left part and the right part and add them together. But I'm doing it element at a time. Right? That's the key. So instead of adding the whole vector together, I'm doing this element at a time. Uh, so, that's, so that's for the addition. And then the only other operation I have in this you know, incredibly simple subalgebra is value operation. And that simply returns uh, the left. Uh, so it just returns the value of the, of the sub-expression. In, which in, in this case it has to be uh, a concrete you know, result type, simple data type. Okay, so and that's it basically. That is the whole um, expression template mechanism for simple, uh, for these very simple uh, example. Uh, and that's all we need to do. So you just need to have some representation of expressions and partial specializations of their implementation. Uh, and then to, to do it in practice, in, because you know, this is not an, the ideal way of doing it, um, but yeah, so you, you use it simply by saying evaluate uh, BA. So this, is, this line here is the equivalent of what we had before. Uh, and in this case, uh, I don't create a temporary. Right, because uh, it goes, it only goes, it recursively goes into into these sub-expressions. It only ever pulls out the third element. It adds everything element by element. So instead of going through vectors like that, it's only ever adding elements like that. Right. So you don't have, you never have a temporary. You're only ever iterating once through each piece of memory. And in this case, because I'm only actually interested in the third result, I only compute. Uh, this particular element of the result, and I'll, I never even compute the others. Okay, so <coughs> yeah. I get a little bit confused because you're always accessing the third element, but your vectors only have two elements up there. Or? No, this they have ten elements, ah, okay. uh, which ah. yeah. Sorry, the the question was uh, why I'm always accessing the third or rather the fourth element, uh, but the vectors have two elements. But in in the standard vector. So in, in the standard uh, library vector, the, when you initialize it, the first argument is the number of elements, and the second argument is the initial value. And I've just put one and two here, so it wouldn't be exactly the same. But, 
Okay, so this this is all sort of simple stuff, but uh, I actually yeah. So I mean, the, the way to really understand it actually is a simple function called nm minus c. This is the beauty of it, and this is what explains to you actually how this works. So it's a it's a Linux function which just means names, and minus c means the mangle, and just shows you what names are present in the object code. So you compile all of this, you run n nm minus c, and you get the names of the object or of the functions in the object code. Right now. Once you do expression templates, this is what you find, is that you know this this line here finishes, you know somewhere in the hotel over there, right? So it's a long, long line <laughs> because these names get very long because these names now um, represent what needs to be done. So once you wrap things up properly, which I encourage you to do, uh, <laughs> so you can read it, uh, this tells you you know what's actually happened and what is the actual evaluate function that's actually in the object code. And this is what it looks like, and uh, and you can see that. So these binops. So what it basically tell you, tells you is that the well, if you look at so this is the type of the function. This is the type of, of the argument it takes. Uh, so it's a binary operation which operates on a binary operation, which operates on a binary operation, which operates on a you know value operation uh, and a value operation, and adds them together and then adds together the next value, and then adds together the next value. And all of these values are double, right? So this name actually contains precisely the algorithm that this function does. And you would have a different name like this for each, for each uh, different expression that you have in your, in your code, right? And this is, this is why it works. So it actually, you know, this, this function is specialized to adding you know, four vectors together, we should type double, right? That's what this function does, and it's, it, that's, it's encoded its name, and it's specifically designed to do that. So in a way, you know, expression templates have let us uh, have, uh, if I go back to here, right? So it's essentially given me, you know, this function here, but in a totally transparent way. So a specialized function which adds four or five vectors in this case together, but it's all done transparently under the covers. Uh, and then through partial specialization and lots of compiler optimization, which goes under the covers, it, it's you know you get an efficient implementation. Graph is I've taken this, put into a Python parser. I have to admit, <laughs> for some things Python is useful, and uh, and created a graph out of it. So it's it's actually a good way to visualize it. It's not a good way to visualize it on a limited resolution. Uh, PowerPoint slide, or in this case, latex slide, because you, know, you can't scroll around, but in practice you can sort of scroll around and actually figure out what the types are. So it's, so this is the, essentially the, you know, the syntax tree, this is the expression tree that you're trying to evaluate. Uh, and then your partial specialization is going essentially through this tree and implementing, you know, each operation at a time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's clever, you know, it's great, and it works very well. Um, so yeah, so in this case it's not so useful, but you know I think this this is looking at these, looking at these as trees is it's a very useful way of looking at it. Okay, so essentially um, expression templates are giving you lazy co lazy evaluation. So, which is not the same uh, as lazy code generation, which is the title of my talk and what I'm talking about in the next part. So lazy evaluation means that uh, you know operations and sometimes function calls. <coughs> return expressions, not results, right? And then um, the, the order and how this implement, the implementation of these expressions and sub-expressions is um, decided upon later, still at compile time, but not exactly at the step where the compiler sees this you know, plus. It's decided later. And by, by being able to look at the whole tree of these expressions rather than individual steps, you can make very significant optimizations. So you can make very significant optimizations in terms of you know, how you access the memory, how you generate the temporaries, if you need any temporaries at all, and actually which parts of the results do you need to compute at all, and maybe you don't need to compute most of it. So, uh, uh, you know, so it's, that's why you, know, you can get really high efficiency. Um, so actually, and now, so this, the concept of lazy evaluation is so sort of come up again because we were talking about it uh, in terms of Haskell yesterday. Um, 
and you know Haskell yeah, does it sort of properly. <laughs> it gets you know, everything is totally lazy, and uh, you don't want to have a huge program in C++ where everything is an expression template because you know this tree would start to grow very 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 large <laughs> and uh, be difficult to compile. Um, and then there are some subtle things to keep in mind, and you know one of them is side effects, right? Because you know you mustn't you know each of the implementations you have to be very careful about not having side effects in these implementations which you do through partial specialization because you don't know how they're going to get reordered essentially eventually right so side effects so the combination of side effects and uh, lazy evaluation is is very bad <laughs> it's, and that, that doesn't it just doesn't work very well um, and then the second problem is that you know depending on how big um, your expression trees are you can have very very large uh, names of functions and big templates but you know the modern compilers can deal with this really quite well okay uh, and then you know some of the examples you know there's many actually really good libraries now which which use um, uh, these expression templates and uh, and you know, highly optimized implementations to do mostly linear algebra and, and simple array operations. So these are the, this is the list, and you know, that you should use one of these basically. Unless I mean, you're not going to do much better. <laughs> so, well, and if you are going to do much better, then yeah, you should start with these as a starting point. Yep. I just wanted to say that NT2 is a boost software license. Oh, oh, it's boost as well. Yeah. Okay, I think the web page said. Perhaps you refer to the old version. Right. The, the new version will is boost. Okay, yes. No, this is the yeah, I just this is what I saw on the web page, so that's all I that's all I knew. Um so okay. So all of this was uh you know, an old story, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I've left myself twenty minutes to talk about something new, which hopefully is uh is probably the right balance because you know Whilst this, I think, will be interesting, you know, the actual field of applications is even smaller than you know, what we were talking about up to now. Um, okay, so what about lazy code generation? How, you know, what it is and how it works? Well, in standard templates, uh, the type, the type of the function, the type of the structures, conveys what we want to uh, want want to do, and then these types are interpreted at compile time through partial specialization. So partial specialization is essentially a way of interpreting types and doing different things depending on what the type is. And through partial specialization, at compile time, you decide what code you want to generate to do the algorithm. And you generate the code, and that's it. Uh, and you have a final object code which is, you know, does everything that you need. So the idea of lazy code generation is that you use the first part of expression template, so you still use the types to record you know, what needs to be done, uh, but you don't actually do the implementation. Right? So you don't do the implementation in the header files, you don't do the implementation through partial specialization. You rely on the fact that the type is still present in the object code, in, this, in these function names. So just by reading the object code post facto, without having to pass C++, uh, you can see what needs to be done, and then you can implement it whichever way you want. Right? You don't have to implement it using C++, or you can implement it using C++, but you can just pass in these types again, and you have another go, essentially, and generate in the code. So it introduces you know, flexibility and introduces modularity. Uh, but it does mean that you know, your tool chain has got even more complicated. Okay, so here's a... You know, one way of thinking about it. So this is the, the reference card for BLAS. BLAS is the basic linear algebra system. So this was a Fortran library designed I don't know, 35 years ago or something, um, which does different types of uh, linear algebra operations. So you can see, I mean, yeah, you can't probably read it at all. But, I mean, you can see straight away, you know, these are not functions which, you know, there's clearly there's a big, there's a pattern here. Right. So they're not random names for these functions. They're all simple functions with simple names, but there's not, they're not random, these names. And in <coughs> fact, you know, each, the each name of a function in, in BLAS actually encodes um, what that function does in a one-to-one -one mapping, in a systematic way. And you know, one of the parts of the function tells you 
you know, does it do a scale product? Does it do a, do a sum, uh, you know, matrix next blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, the second part of the function tells you, is it, you know, single, double, and complex numbers? And the third part tells you, you know, what sort of type of packing of these matrices you have. So, so here you have, you know, you can see the parallel to what we were talking about before. You know, function, function type is essentially a function name, it, you know, with a you know, it's markup syntax, right? And we already had that 35 years ago, right? So the names, you know, names have patterns, and they tell you what, you know, what you need to do, right? So if I go back to this, you know, this, this is expression template we had before. This is just another name in a particular pattern, and this, this name tells you what this function does, right? This is what it looks like without demangling, right? The the function name. So this you can think of this function name as a as a sort of compile time generator. So this name is generated at compile time, but it is a specification of what needs to be done. And all you need to to get that, all you need to do is run this nm program. And and from this I can match I can match what I want what this function needs to be done to whatever other functions I have. Put them together and link them in. So another way of looking at it is that expression templates allow you to to take a part of C++, right? To so take an expression in C++ or a combination of function of C++ and export uh, the program parse tree outside of the compiler and make it available post-compilation time. So. And you could say, I mean, what is the alternative? The alternative would be to you know, write another C++ source code parser, which we know has to be essentially a compiler, to export this, um, this uh, parse tree. So you basically have a mechanism, and all expression templates do that. You have a mechanism to export a subset of the parse tree outside the compiler environment, where you can do whatever you want with it. Okay. And this is the idea of lazy code generation, is making use of that by just reading back that in into another tool and uh, making use of it. So, so what are the advantages? Well, you get a basically you get a, a clean separation between you know specification or, or what it is that needs to be done and from how it's done. Um, and uh, so, for example, I mean, you know, so specifically, you can. Because you compile your code once, and then you can read in this, uh, you know, this abstract syntax tree several times back, you can actually try out different algorithms now. Select the best one, and then link that one into the code, and it will work. Right? So you have the ability to try in different algorithms. Uh, you can detect hardware and generate efficient code without access to source code. So you can just give somebody your compile program, They'll run it for you, and they'll just you know, put the implementations or the difficult bits in themselves, right? And you don't have to reveal uh, you know, your intellectual property, and vice versa. Library uh, library writers can you know, keep you know, the key bits of the library secret and just give you the interfaces. Uh, and you can use custom you know, third-party tools, so you can mix and match whatever you want, basically. Okay. So I have yeah ten minutes for an example, which is and it's a very very simple example. So this is and this is how far I got in this whole idea. So I'm not going to say I've got a big product at the end of this. I'm afraid all all I've got is uh, this simple example, but it does work and and it's you know, already could be useful in some uh, again narrow applications. So I talked about FFTs and I talked about how you know it depends basically on. Array, array length. So the optimum algorithm is a function of hardware, and it's a function of just the dimensions of the data that you put in, and that's it. So it's quite a simple interface. So normally, the the, the optimum algorithm is selected at the runtime, like I mentioned, right? But can we do better if we know the size of the arrays and compile time? Can we do better using this lazy cogeneration? And this is how it will work. Okay, so so now I'm using boost array because it's got fixed size sizes at compile time. Right? Okay, so and I'm using again the trivial example of ten element long arrays, and I have this abstract call to FFT forward, so forward Fourier transform, which takes some input and this is an output. Trivial, um, but I yeah I, I know the arrays at compile time, right? So I know this is going to be ten. So if I make this just a templated function. Uh, I can actually select 
an algorithm um, before runtime. But so I don't want to select. I don't. I wouldn't really want to. Even if I could generate F50 algorithms using partial specializations in C++, I really I wouldn't want to do it straight away because maybe I want to compile this program on machine this, and I want to link it together and run it on machine B, right? So if if the whole algorithm is selected as soon as I compile my application, right, I have to recompile this application every time for every different type of machine that I'm going to run on. So I don't want to run it, I don't want to generate it at compile time, but I want to generate it before runtime because actually selecting the optimal algorithm takes a bit of time because you have to try out different ones and find the best one. So in the case of 10 element arrays, it's trivial and it takes you know, microseconds. But if you're doing you know, 10 million size arrays, which is you know, typically what we do, uh, then it's, you know, it does take a bit of time. And also it increases program. Um, you know, you, because you have to have all the algorithms available at runtime to select from, you're increasing the code size and uh, the performance is less predictable because if there's a, you, know, you have a multitasking operating system and something you know, starts to use up your time and you're selecting algorithms, you might select the wrong one. So how, the, how, the, how does this work? Right. So um, in, in F50W, uh, you ask it to uh, select the best algorithm by uh, calling this function, which is basically plan, called plan, and you're telling it you know, plan on how to do these algorithms, how to do these transforms. This, this is what this function does. Uh, so the first time, so that when you ask, so in this case, I'm putting five in here, because actually I've, I've packed, I've assumed that these arrays are uh, complex numbers because Fourier transforms don't really make sense on you know, purely real numbers. So I'm assuming that it's just you know, real imaginary part, real imaginary part. Anyway, that's, that's the detail. And um, it takes about one second for reasonable sized um, uh, sort of arrays. So it doesn't, you, know, you don't want to be doing this if you're starting your program over and over and over again. Yeah, it's not the best thing to have a one second delay straight away if you have some sort of a consumer you know, DSP type application, say, right? Um, so how do we do this? Well, so we would make this um, FFT forward, we just make it a templated function uh, where you know, the type is the type of the array and n is the length of the array, so very simple. And you just call FFT forward like uh, you know, we were going to call it anyway. And, and then we, you know, we basically we just compile this without providing any implementation, right? So this is just a declaration here. And we don't, we don't provide an implementation at all for this function. And then you compile it. So you have object code without, you know, which is empty of an implementation. And you run nm on it, and this is what you see, right? So it tells you f of t forward of doubles of length n, right? So you've, you've, and you might have an application with you know, hundreds of these calls, but it's, it's told you that you need to generate a function which does forward Fourier transforms on doubles over a, over a of length 10, okay? So all we need to do is parse this, uh, generate a, a new specialization for each of these uh, different um, you know, types, and then compile and link uh, with the original code. And we don't need access to the, we, don't, we no longer need access to this. So as soon as we have this object file, it tells us everything we need to know. And it's very, you know, it's very simple. So again, so green here is Python. Um, so, so to pass the simple table, well, you just run nm minus e and you have a simple regular expression in this case. It's, it's simple enough that you don't need to do anything. You just, you pick up uh, the, you know, the length of the array that you need to implement a simple group here, that's all you need to do. And it tells you, it, it will give you the size of the transform that you need to generate. So that, that tells you everything you need to know about what sort of code you need to generate. And then, you know, to actually select the algorithm, well I've cheated here a little bit, so I didn't want to go into the depth of FFTW and you know, make it, so all I've done is actually um, created a, a trivial stub program uh, which generates a, a stub uh, call to this FFTW plan function, uh, where it where the the size of the length of the array is a variable uh, parameter. So and then I put that in b 
because I read it from the object table of the object code. And I, I just write this to a file, compile it down, call FFTW with the right size, uh, yeah, tell it to select the best algorithm, and then I print this algorithm back out. Right? So FFTW has a mechanism for printing out what algorithm it selected uh, for a particular array size. Uh, and then I have another function which uh, basically creates. So it, this function takes as, um, uh, yeah, so it takes, uh, n is the, the size of the array you want to transform, and it calls these previous functions basically, and the, the plan variable is just the, the al selected algorithm. Okay, and then this function just generates a small C++ file with a single function, uh, which is the partial specialization of the FFT forward uh, function, and here in this constant uh, character string, I put in the selected algorithm. Right? So in there, as basically as string, I encode what algorithm needs to be done. So it no longer needs to be selected. It's in there, in that function. You just submit this function to, code, to a file, compile that, and then all you need to do is link it in. So this function, because these uh, the symbols here, you know, this W here means that this, this is a big symbol, and in this case, in fact, it's not even uh, linked in at all. So you just need to generate an, an implementation of this function, which is what I've done programmatically from Python, compile it using plain C++, and link it in, and you have uh, an implementation of this uh, FFT forward, which uses still FFTW, but the plan is pre-selected, and it's pre-selected because you know what you need to do. So, and the, the, the beauty of it is that you can compile the first application on your main machine, and then you can do this last second set of compilations and linking on your target machine without giving the, everybody your source code. Right? So you just give them the object file, and they just say, okay, this is what they need to compile on this machine. This is the target-specific code. You do that, and um, you know, it'll work. So, so what have we achieved with this? Well, um, you know, we've selected the optimum uh, transform uh, in advance of the, of the runtime of the program. So it's just more efficient because every, you don't have to redo this every time you start the program. And, for example, if you say, you know, tomorrow we get a brand new computer uh, with a GPU, which you can do FFTs in a much more efficient way without even using the processor, you would just write a new stub in here which does that. Right. Instead of calling FTW, you can call anything. Right. You're not at all, you're not at all uh, tied to an implementation of the algorithm. You just said what needs to be done. Okay. So, uh, but the in this simple example, uh, because I, you know, I was taking shortcuts. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, we are still in this simple example. I'm still linking in the whole of FTW. So, I'm not gaining in the terms of cutting down the overall code size. And I'm loading in the plan at, uh, from a string, which, which is not efficient. I mean, ideally you'd have some, you know, ideally you'd have some sort of even better encoded implementation or specification of which particular combination of algorithms is chosen. So you save yourself the passing of a string overhead. Okay, so, um, so right, just finishing. I just got a few more minutes. So, um, yeah, so, so as a summary, so, you know, simple-minded C++ code uh, is not numerically efficient, even though compilers can do a really great job in getting it back to reasonable efficiency. Um, and you, yeah, I mean, this is another example where I have a huge vector, uh, and I want to just, you know, you wouldn't write this, but you have to think about not writing this, where I've taken one, you know, I've divided, I take the reciprocal of this vector, which is an expensive operation, only to get the fifth element. Um, so the function arguments are always evaluated promptly. So this, this just gets evaluated first, and then it thinks, aha, I need a fifth one. Right? So the fact that this eager evaluation, it's always going to hurt you. You only have binary operators, so it limits the number of, uh, it limits the sort of optimization you can do by yourself. And the optimal algorithm sometimes can't be selected at compile time. Yeah, in many cases it can. I mean, I'm talking about a you know, narrow range of, of algorithms in, in numerical processing. I'm not saying that all of programming suffers from this at all by any stretch. Um, so the expression templates resolve many of these issues, almost all. 
uh, and uh, and you know some of these libraries they 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 work and they work extremely well actually. Um, but you know you can lazy code generation sort of adds another level of complexity. But you know it allow it gives you new flexibility. Right? So it it means that you can try different algorithms. You know you can delay the selection of the actual algorithm until you have the final hardware, and you have uh, increased. Um, modularization. So you really restored this modularity between headers and implementation, so interfaces and implementations. Right? And you know, when would you want to use it? Well, when you do need to empirically select the optimal algorithm, so you just need to try a few and find out which one is the best. Or when you want to use some fancy tools, you know, so you want to use, say, a GPU compiler together with your C++ code in a sort of automatic way. Or you want you need to re-establish clean separation between the application and the library. So maybe you need to be able to Im update implementations uh, without the access to the original source code, and you don't want you know, you're just not allowed to recompile the whole application. Or maybe there's you know licensing concerns or proprietary libraries. So that's it. Thank you very much. Yep. So, uh, have you heard of the Intel parallel building blocks? I've, so the question was whether I've heard of Intel parallel building blocks, and I, I've heard of it, but I don't know exactly so how it works. It's lazy code generation. Uh, the reason C++ code is slow is because the compiler can't make assumptions yep. that would allow it to parallelize. They created a domain-specific embedded language, which basically has the semantics of Fortran, and they have a jitting compiler in the So they have a JIT. Library yeah. That will uh, parallelize. Yeah. No, there's, and there, there are, I mean, there's, there's a library called NumExpert, EXPR, which is also a JIT type. And, yeah, you can do that. You lose, um, yeah, it's, it can be done, depending on how you do it, you lose some of the type safety, right? Because, y you know, the, the, you know, the, my thinking about this was when I was thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, JIT is it's okay, but you know, first of all, you recomp you're compiling this always at runtime, where you don't really need to, right? In many cases, the algorithm can't change at runtime, so you know at compile time what the algorithm is. So, compiling it at uh, at runtime is it's a bit of an overhead, and also, you know, how do you ensure type safety? So, full type safety. So um, in, in this, I don't know how the, the, this, the Intel uh, building blocks thing works, but here you can retain really full, full type safety because all the types are automatically generated from your calls. So you, know, you, have, you don't need to say, I'm adding these doubles, these arrays of doubles by hand. It's all in there because you're looking at the type of the, uh, of the function. Right? I, it depends how it works. I mean, the so the numexper, the, this numexper library. I mean, what it does is, you know, you say, essentially, what you do, you say, you know, compile, and then you pass the string, a plus b plus c plus d. Okay, right, and then you'll ge that will generate the function, which adds four vectors together. Okay, but. Well, this is the way this runs, but you know, and then you can apply this function to four arrays of doubles. But what if you give it a four arrays of singles? Right? How do you enforce that? Having the string in your code is silly. You can just build it out of expressions directly. Well, how do you build it out of expressions? You have C plus plus types that are type safe that build an AST in memory. It becomes an internal representation of EGIT. Yeah. Yeah, you could, yeah, I don't know how that particularly works. But, so it's a similar, uh, yeah, it's, okay, it's, it's a similar idea, but instead of passing the, the types from, you basically create some sort of a representation uh, by you know, stringing these, these things together, yeah. But there's another drawback, expression templates and also what you're showing with the lazy generation. Uh, at the statement level, the granularity at the statement level is pretty small, 
And the division is generally arbitrary. I ran out of room on my line. Yeah. So you would typically want to do something like type erasure with your expression template so that you can combine them and come up with something larger, a more interesting algorithm yeah. to uh, lazily compile. Yeah. And of course, we can do that pretty simply uh, with the JDM ID. Well, why can't you do it with um, expression templates? Because so if you use type, huh? erase the type. Right, but if you, uh, well, if, yeah. So that you can take multiple statements and right. them together into the But if you if you're using auto types, so I think this was true for if you have auto, I think that changes the game, right? So you can have you can pass functions in, arbitrary functions into other functions with type erasure. Uh, it basically yeah. gives you a, a lazy uh, semantic. Yeah. Well I think yeah, that's yeah, I mean that is you want to have a big Tree, but uh, the um, yeah, I think with the auto type, you can you know, with auto, with the new auto C plus plus, you can string more things together uh, in C plus plus expression templates than you could before, right? Yeah, it yeah. Gives you more. Not quite as much. I mean, look, yeah, this is. I mean, I yeah, I think this is a interesting idea for you know some specific cases where you you know you have lots of C plus plus code and you want to be doing something with it. In a way, I mean, we should be thinking. Yeah, for these super high, we're talking really about embedded languages, and maybe we shouldn't be doing it in C++ at all, right? This is the, uh, you know, when you're talking about, you, you have lots, that much complexity, you know, maybe it's better off to do it in another language. It's a question of, you know, how do you fit it into common uh, programming paradigms now, and how do you interface it with the rest of your code? And, you know, the expression template is already really widely used, and you could actually use this to, for example, re-implement parts of UBLAS without changing any of the code. So everything is absolutely the same. All you do is post-linking, yeah, post-compilation. So just before linking, you can you can rechange the code. Basically, it's not it's a narrow field of applications. I'm not saying it's <laughs> useful for even uh, you know it's useful for a small fraction of problems.